recording, uh, if you don't mind. So sure. uh, Kim McLaren has kindly uh, accepted our invite from John Bardell Architects um, to present uh, and talk about our new home, the new building for the School of um, Design and the Built Environment. Um, Kim is an associate, and um, I'll just pass it on to him later. Uh, he could he could uh, introduce himself uh, more for us, please. Um, so today we'll hear about the process of delivering the building from briefing and concept design through the detailing and construction, exploring how the core design themes, functional requirements, and technical performance of the building interweave to generate a unique and meaningful architecture, uh, architectural outcome. So uh, just a little brief about John Bardell Architects, and I'm pretty sure everyone knows them uh, quite mm -hmm. well. So uh, JWA is internationally renowned for making extraordinary buildings and places that matter. A team of 100 plus design professionals um, who work across Australia and internationally from uh, two studios in Melbourne and Sydney. The practice is a large collaborative environment where every project has a range of creative, technical and strategic uh, contributions from a diverse team of architects and interior designers within JWA. Retaining the creative energy of a small studio Cleaning work up and exploring new territory is fundamental to how the practice works. JWA have expertise in master planning, urban design, architecture, and interior design. Led by founding principal John Wardle, the work ranges across education, residential, and commercial projects, encouraging the cross fertilization of ideas. Many projects by John Wardell Architects have been highly awarded, and I'm not going to name the awards because um, it's going to take the whole one hour. So please just Google, <laughs> you'll find them all. Thank you very much, Kim. Thanks once again for joining us today. Um, I just pass it on to you, please. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Brisa. Um, so yeah, for those of you that um, don't know me, um, yeah, my name is Kim McLaren. I'm associate at John Model Architects, and uh, I'm uh, been working on the Curtin uh, School of Design and Built Environment for a number of years now, um, seeing it the design develop um, over that time. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and bring up my um, presentation now, and uh, and we can dive into it. A little bit more detail. So, hopefully, you can all see that now. Um, so, as Prusa mentioned, actually, I was initially scheduled to give this talk back in March, and um, I planned a trip over to Perth. There was going to be some site visits. I'd uh, come there and present this in person. And at that time, I was thinking, "Yep, nice, simple overview of the." briefing, the key design themes, technical aspects of the building that developed over the course of the project. However, it kind of feels a bit like the world's changed since then. And, um, and so for that reason, I kind of thought it would be worthwhile just to step back slightly before we kind of dive into some of that detail. So as a practice, John Wardle Architects has a clear and seemingly simple vision statement. And that is that it tries to capture the essence of what we, what we aim to achieve. That is making the extraordinary or creating things that matter. And at first glance, statements like this can sound a bit grandiose or perhaps even conceited or just kind of hollow. So today I'd like to kind of outline uh, where we find some of the layers of that meaning that inform our designs. And with any luck by the end of it, hopefully you will agree that what we're aiming to deliver here for the Curtin School of Design and Built Environment will indeed be something extraordinary and, and meaningful. So why does this building matter? Well, if I was standing in front of you in a lecture theatre, this would probably be the point where I'd ask you all to consider the details of the building that we were in. How does it influence your interactions and experience? Are you too cramped in your seat? Can you see over the person in front of you? Is there enough natural light? Um, 
but now that so much of our world is available online and we can all log in from the comfort of our own home and possibly in our pajamas um, perhaps this large-scale buildings for education and work are, are no longer irrelevant or even required I mean you could almost start to think that as architects we should really you know pivot and focus on residential development and all start designing beautiful little home office spaces well we have done a few of those and uh, I'm sure there will be some growth in that area um, but while there's likely to be some physical distancing requirements that uh, extend around the world for quite a while yet I don't see large-scale building typologies becoming completely obsolete in a hurry in a and I suppose in a post COVID-19 world, you could certainly argue that many buildings may no longer be able to rely on being uh, kind of mandatory utilitarian vessels that people are just required to occupy. People will have greater choice about working and learning from home or their location that they prefer. But all this really means is that this kind of architecture needs to work much harder to entice people out to demonstrate the benefits of collective spaces, shared resources and face-to-face -face interactions. So mediocre and, and kind of dehumanising workplaces could potentially become vacant or obsolete quite rapidly as people have this choice where they want to study or work. And that's probably a good thing. Of course, not everybody has the luxury of a study space like this one in which uh, they get to do their work. And probably the more common reality is actually something like this, where you're studying at home uh, in not quite enough space and haven't quite managed to cram everything in. So I think that facilities that are really well designed and have shared study and workspace um, and that are uplifting and inspiring will remain very relevant and highly valued places that people will, of course, continue to actively seek out. And the feedback from our previously completed projects, like what you're seeing here, certainly supports that idea. In fact, a common complaint that we often hear from these kind of projects at other universities is that the buildings are just too popular and that the best study spots have all been nabbed by nine o'clock in the morning. So these are actually some of the different study spaces all within the Monash Learning and Teaching Building. In fact, when I was last going there, I caught an Uber and my driver was telling me that he studied at Monash and he was actually quite upset and disappointed that they closed this building at nine o'clock each night and that he wasn't able to stay there and study and work later into the evening. And this touches on probably one of the most fundamental reasons that I personally practice architecture. So for me, the creation of inspiring spaces that can be used to and experienced by a multitude of people, regardless of their own personal wealth or resources, is the bigger kind of picture aspiration here. For a student from a disadvantaged background who may not have a good home life, this building can become like a second home and it helps give them that opportunity and that level of kind of levels the playing field so that they can might be able to excel at their studies. And look, I don't want to overstate this. I'm not certainly not saying that architecture can just solve inequality and social injustice, but I think that it can and it should always try to consider how it contributes to these kinds of issues. So this image here is the Melbourne School of Design. And there's no doubt that creating architecture like this is a great privilege and requires a lot of money uh, and a lot of resources. So to justify this, not only does the architecture need to be inspiring and appealing to those who come in here, but it also does need to be inclusive and broadly benefit not just a select few. So this to me is really where architecture has, finds great meaning. And of course, universities have been grappling with the issue of how to create an engaging campus experience for students for a long time before any coronavirus came along. And Curtin University is no exception. The initial vision for developing the Northern Campus Exchange Precinct is one of the first pieces of the puzzle that helps to explain how 
we actually go about creating something meaningful and extraordinary in the uh, new DBE building. Architecture doesn't exist in an isolated bubble and there are many decisions that are made beyond the traditional realm of architecture that can have a profound impact on the building design. Back in 2017, we were working on the master plan and concept design for the DBE building as part of a consortium bid for the whole precinct development. At this time, there was a critical decision that would fundamentally change the direction of the building form. This was the extent of the site boundary. So the initial brief for the DBE building was to fit within the lot boundary highlighted here roughly in yellow. With the volume of space required in the schedule of accommodation, this would result in a very tall and narrow building that was split over up to 10 levels. This arrangement would really struggle to deliver the open and interconnected internal spaces that were also really essential to the brief. So instead of just accepting the kind of lot we were given, we actually challenged this aspect of the brief and proposed a building design that required the site boundary to extend further north. And this was a potentially pretty risky move given the commercial implications of such a shift. However, this expanded site allowed space for a broader and lower building mass with a central courtyard and an atrium, one that, and that would become the key features of this building design. And again, this idea was supported by our previous work that we'd done at Monash at the Learning and Teaching Building. Here we also proposed to turn the dominant existing building typology, a, a slab kind of tower, onto its side and create something more like a ground scraper. This building is like a low level micro city of learning spaces with its own internal network of streets, courts and lanes, a campus or within a campus where activity is kept close to the ground and stairs are more important than lifts. Although the Curtin DBE building is quite a bit smaller than this non-ash one, it's a compelling idea and still resonated very strongly with us. And it unlocked this opportunity to explore a, a courtyard building typology that opened up to the north and provided a focal point at the heart of the building. On the left here, we can see an early site plan proposal from 2016 prior to expanding the lot boundary. By 2017, we had transformed the site plan and the key features of this building were really starting to take shape. The courtyard and the central atrium were now defined as a focal point for this building and many of the other spatial arrangements internally were also coming together. When we first presented this visualisation to Curtin stakeholders back in 2017, we still hadn't completed the concept design stage. So while many of the details you see in this image here uh, would evolve and change over the coming years, the, that core vision still remained clear. Now you might still be wondering, how do you convince a client just to give you more space to design a building? Surely that doesn't just happen because you have a hunch that it might be uh, a better design outcome. And you, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's, this is possibly the exception to the rule rather than a good assumption that you would make when generally designing a building. However, in this instance, we didn't kind of just have a hunch because throughout 2016, JW had been working closely with Curtin Uni on the briefing requirements and had already been engaged to prepare a project definition plan. So this detailed document outlined the project vision, key stakeholders, the functional briefing requirements, project exemplars, budgets, and also various lot boundary options. So prior to completing any conceptual architectural design, we already had an intimate understanding of how the university envisaged this building and what briefing items might be more flexible than others. From this knowledge, we could clearly demonstrate in detail how expanding the site would much better align with the core aspirations of the project and still ensure a viable site for future commercial development. Many project briefs have internal conflicts or contradictions 
and to unravel these issues and provide clarity around the opportunities and constraints of one option over another is a really powerful tool that uh, often gets overlooked in architecture. So our involvement in developing this project definition plan was also vital to cementing the core identity and themes of the building that would later drive so many aspects of their built form. A community of practice, a school of collaboration, a project as pedagogy, a building for diversity. Both JWA and Curtin understood and were really committed to this identity for the school and this shared vision and close relationship between client and architect is where architecture can first find genuine meaning in kind of meaningful roots to grow from. We started to create basic sketches or diagrams that aim to capture the key phrases that were embedded in these briefing documents. Um, there's an understanding of the school's history of project-based pedagogy that revolved around the key activities of thinking, making and showing. Each of these activities required a particular setting, the collaboration hub, maker's space, exhibition and gallery. One could imagine students using each area for different stages of learning and exploring the design. Each of these settings need to be closely linked and located on the ground floor where they are evident from the street and really promote the identity of the school. The inclusion of industry partner tenancy spaces within the academic building was, was driven also by the goal of creating a broader community of collaboration. Not just collaboration between students and staff, but also with local businesses in the design and construction industry. JWA started to map out them and an understanding of how the activities and all the functional relationships between different user groups would inhabit the building. This starts to inform the massing studies and different space typologies. But often before any 3D modelling of a building is prepared, other ideas might take form in a sketch that just tries to capture something more conceptual. We would have spent countless hours discussing the idea of reimagining the blue carpet with Curtin University. This term often raises a few eyebrows and requires some further explanation to those who are new to Curtin or maybe haven't spent any time in building 201. So even though the actual blue carpet within the building 201 has long since been replaced, the history and the activities in this iconic space is at the core of the school's identity, an expanded circulation zone that could be appropriated for a variety of activities. Pin-up displays, group discussions, quiet study, crits, a small tutorial, just relaxing or even a, an event. In our reimagining of this element, it weaves its way up through the building and interconnects the more formal learning spaces. So regardless of the final shape, colour or extent of this concept, there was an agreement at the outset that this was aspect of the school's identity was really fundamental to the design. Similarly, the idea of the building being like a wunderkammer or a cabinet of curiosities is another anchoring concept for the design. A building that embodies the character of a 17th century artefact where small collections of extraordinary objects are displayed and categorised to tell stories about the wonder and oddities of the wider world. Well, it's a, a bit of an obscure reference, and this, but this concept also really links to the initial curtain vision statements from the project definition plan. They really wanted the building to turn inside out. This aim of expressing a diverse interior, a collection of learning and collaborative experiences that are curated and choreographed for maximum effect. So this vision was a real key driver for the external expression of the building as the design developed. Here's another concept design image from 2017 that we prepared looking at the south elevation along Collini Way. The facade is designed to appear like a sectional slice through the building that reveals the activities within. It's teased apart in the central atrium, the learning terrace, and the various informal learning areas of the reimagined blue that are all revealed to the broader campus. 
Of course, the idea of revealing the activities within the building isn't unique to the Curtin DBE project. And we've explored this concept in many other ones. Now, this is actually a, this is actually a sectional cut now. This is through a 3D model of the Ian Potter South Bank Centre. And this is Melbourne University's new conservatorium of music, which hosts a variety of re rehearsal and performance spaces for musicians that are in training. This building is imagined as a backstage green room to the adjacent recital halls of the Melbourne Arts Pre. We designed the building to encourage curiosity and interaction between the musicians and their community, an invitation to pull back the curtains and to open the door to the vault. So that idea was quite almost quite literally translated and manifested architecturally into a giant oculus window that opens on the ground floor and it reveals the orchestral rehearsal space to the adjacent public park, providing an insight into the inner realm of musical education. From within the auditorium, this gesture is possibly even more dramatic. The spectacle of watching a seven metre high wheel roll its way across to reveal or eclipse the oculus becomes almost like a performance in itself. Here we can see uh, uh, the oculus and the shutter mechanism during construction. And it helps to illustrate the complex engineering and the design behind it all. This is actually one of my favorite photos of the whole project. And it often makes me wonder about how much we choose to conceal within a building. The idea of showcasing the activities within a building can also extend to revealing the building structure, services and technology, telling the story of how the building actually functions. This links us back to another key design theme for Curtin DBE, building as pedagogy. Using the building as a teaching and learning tool was fundamental to the initial brief for the new DBE building. And here, a 3D view of the proposed exhibition space where all the services and structure in the ceiling will be fully exposed. Leaving these elements visible has long uh, been a commonplace uh, strategy in quite utilitarian buildings like warehouses and factories. So there's nothing really new there. But when it comes to designing and curating these elements as part of a cohesive design expression, this starts to require far more coordination, detailing and precision. These images here are quite beautiful in their technicality and they highlight just thousands of clashes between different building elements that are all 3D modelled and coordinated during the design and documentation stage. This intricate web of elements all needs to fit together and we utilise BIM clash detection software like Navisworks to help us locate and highlight every pipe or duct that might be intersecting with a beam or cable tray. It doesn't actually mean that the software knows how to solve the problem. Understanding and resolving all these issues takes hundreds of hours and multiple engineers to be precisely coordinated. And of course, everybody wants an efficient building with plenty of usable floor space for people. They want compact service rises and generous internal ceiling heights. So finding those creative ways to interweave and compress everything together can be quite an art form and that requires plenty of patience. The process often continues well into the construction as well, as we see the subcontractors complete even more detailed shop drawings, 3D models that continue to refine the design and the methods of installation. The um, Ceiling, the ceiling treatments here um, can be expressed in um, a few different ways. So this is actually three different uh, images from the Melbourne School of Design. And here we looked at the idea that we was, uh, using a building as a pedagogy wasn't just about always revealing all the engineering. It's actually about the design decisions that are made about when you reveal and conceal. 
So there are, there are specialist learning spaces that have fully exposed services. There are areas where they're partially concealed and then fully concealed. And we took a similar approach for the DBE building. So we can see here that the exhibition space, as I mentioned, and the blue carpet all have fully exposed services that are choreographed and laid out with precision. Then in the specialist learning spaces and the, and the staff workplace, we've got an expanded metal mesh that is partially transparent and allows kind of concealing of the services, um, but still some sense of the uh, intricacy beyond. And then through the foyer and central circulation areas, we have a timber ceiling where panels with panels that conceal the services. And the colour and texture that comes from these timber ceiling panels is a key ingredient to also to creating a warm interior glow from within the building that contrasts with a cool kind of grey exterior. Sometimes we talk about this contrast in the office or in our studio as raw and cooked elements of the building. We focus on the inhabited areas that have highly refined elements of timber that are set against the rawness of exposed concrete structures. These are some snapshots of the uh, atrium space within the DBE building. And we can see here that the stair becomes a highly articulated timber clad element that winds its way up through the building. And it's set in front of a continuous in situ concrete wall as its backdrop. And here are some actual photos from site from just a few weeks ago. Um, the stairs aren't quite done yet, obviously, uh, and the timber cladding still isn't there. But what you can see is that raw concrete wall that kind of sits behind and quietly anchors the space while the stair can kind of dance in front. Looking at these for now, I also start to wonder whether I'll reflect back in years to come whether more of this steel structure itself should have remained exposed, much like the, uh, the conservatorium uh, building I showed you before. But cladding actually isn't always just an aesthetic decision. So for the stairs in this atrium, the timber panels are also perforated and they've got an acoustic backing that significantly reduces sound reverberation. The acoustic performance of this building is as finely tuned and critical as any other design aspect. And particularly when you've got atriums and large voids with open study areas, they all require rigorous acoustic modelling to ensure that noise levels are kept suitable. And this isn't just a nice to have preference for the comfort of students and staff. It's actually uh, linked to the Green Star target ratings for the building. So back in 2016, the original briefing and vision for the DBE building was to achieve a five star Green Star rating. Best practice, Australian excellence. However, as we know, the world continues to change rapidly and the urgency for clear leadership in the sustainable design and environmental performance has certainly not lessened. So in 2018, Curtin strengthened their commitment and increased the goal to a six star world leading sustainable design. Now, um, there, there's lots of different rating tools out there um, and the, uh, the requirements for this are far reaching and highly detailed from acoustics to daylight modelling and from material use to energy use. In fact, I could spend more than an hour just talking about this process. However, one area I would like to touch on, which relates to the Green Star rating and the serious environmental performance of this building, is a distinctive design element as well. And that's the external screen. So this, this element wraps around most of the building on the north, the east and the west facades. And it works as an external sun shading device that keeps out the heat and glare while still allowing views out from within. As this first line of defence from Perth's hot sun, the screen is made up of sheets of zinc that are first perforated to become 50% open area. These sheets are then folded into a series of different ribbed profiles that strategically enhance the performance of not only blocking the sun, 
but also improving its structural integrity. The corrugated profile um, provides these panels with added rigidity that maximizes their ability to span. And this then minimizes the supporting steel frames that are required behind it. The result is hopefully like a delicate veil around the building that gives the facade another layer of depth as light and shade play across the folds and perforations. This is another design concept actually that's had um, quite some history and important learnings that can be taken from previous projects. The Melbourne School of Design was completed in 2014 and was one of, it was our first project where we really explored the external screen as a key design element for the facade. The panels of zinc were perforated and folded into a multitude of different configurations and patterns that projected out from the building to frame views and articulate the facade. And naturally all these different projecting panels and cantilevers, they all still needed to be supported by a steel frame. And uh, at MSD, these were quite extensive. A few years later, the zinc screen was reimagined and refined at the Monash Learning and Teaching Building. Here we used a finer level of uniform perforations on the zinc panels and a more efficient and regular subframe support structure. The subtle scalloped profile of the screen added depth and softness to the facade, while a dappled light internally continued to enhance that veil-like effect. Compared to the kind of almost frenzy of irregular panels, flaps and folds at MSD, I find the screen at Monash has a much more calming effect on the building that subtly helped to kind of dissolve the mass of what is a very big building behind. So for the Curtin DBE building, the zinc screen has evolved again. Third time's a charm. Taking some cues from the more angular folding planes at MSD, but now utilizing a more efficient support system and a restrained palette of details, the screen aims to be robust in form and yet delicate in detail. We hope that this screen really brings together that environmental performance, the structural engineering and facade design into an expressive outer skin that articulates the building form and frames views from both inside and out. And as a learning tool, every one of these connections and details will be on show to analyze and critique. Another building element that is a design lineage that goes well back before this project commenced is brickwork. And of course, Curtin has a very strong building heritage in red bricks that are a core part of the campus character. So acknowledging this tradition was essential. And so we did, so as we did with the blue carpet in building of 201, we were keen to find a new way to uh, work with this very familiar building block. And over many years, JWA, JWA has developed quite an affinity for working with bricks and integrating them into our projects. Our back catalogue of research and details from, from previous projects is very varied and extensive, subtly undulating brickwork facades to unusual bond patterns and super scaled interior elements. We've pushed the scope of brickwork to the extreme in many cases. At our concept design stage, the proposal for a podium of brickwork around the base of the building um, was fairly modest, but it was articulated to align with the human scale and to encourage physical interaction and tactility. It could be a bench seat, a series of steps, a display plinth, or a low retaining wall. As the design developed, the geometry and the extent became a bit more defined. Southwest corner became a focal point where terraced seating and steps up to the Undercroft walkway along Collini Way. And this corner, you know, is, is a critical juncture of Beasley Avenue, Collini Way, uh, and is that kind of um, ground experience of the, of the uh, building. 
Now, tapering and kind of angular brick terraces uh, were required to mediate the steep gradient of the Collini Way footpath. But we also knew it was essential to minimise cutting bricks or creating a, you know, a raft of custom sized bricks. So we wanted to develop a new bond pattern for this project that would give us some flexibility to work with some angles and forms despite only having actually rectangular bricks. So here we can see a pattern that, that we developed um, that creates different offsets for the, for the uh, bond and allows the uh, brick terraces to rake in and across the site. Takes on various forms, whether it's um, in front of retail space, the maker's space, or that uh, southwest corner. And the texture that is created by these bricks almost um, as it angles out has this kind of scale-like effect where the, the depth and the shadow of it um, is really amplified. And in our studio, on our deck, we actually did some proto early prototyping typing of these bond patterns, getting brick samples, testing colours and sizes, stacking them up ourselves to, uh, to make sure that the, the design concept was sound. So at the entries around the base of this building, this brickwork patination and texture will extend through to provide those spots for people to sit and interact with the building on a more intimate scale. Final design element that I would like to touch on is the learning terrace. And this is one of those key design outcomes that came from reimagining the blue carpet. So linking between levels two and three, this is a augmented circulation space that offers a variety of different informal learning activities to occur. Group discussions can be here, pin-ups, quiet study. Like I said, spaces like this are specifically designed also to enhance that bump factor, the chance interaction of meeting somebody that you don't normally run into. Again, we draw on uh, and learn from previous projects where stairs are expanded to be much more than just circulation. And a variety of different ways to create platforms that are, have got actual uh, desks and study zones or just couches or open flat floor. So we can see here uh, Learning Terrace now from the upper level looking down. And the other thing that it does is it starts to find a way to connect to the broader atrium and the perches and edges of it beyond. So we can see here the levels above all have joinery elements that wrap around and allow people to linger and to occupy the edges of the void. And while quite different in form and details, this principle of inhabiting the around the atrium was also explored at Melbourne School of Design, squeezing this activity into every available space. The group study tables are always like literally kind of bursting at the seams through the atrium balustrade here. And then understanding also that when you have these large volumes of space, that basic human desire for kind of prospect and refuge come about to um, bring excitement, but also comfort to the spots that students and staff get to inhabit. And here in the Curtin uh, TV building, we take that approach again. We can see looking down now from the uh, level four. So this has just been quite a small snapshot really of some of the aspects of the DBE building and of course some of the associated work that we do at JWA. But hopefully some of these layers of meaning behind the architecture are quite apparent and they provide uh, a more kind of comprehensive context to how we go about designing the design process and also how they evolve from other, one project to another. Practicing architecture 
you know, becomes like that collective learning process. You are actually practicing each time and learning from what you've done. And the final outcome isn't really just about one big idea. Um, its strength comes from a multitude of them. Site context, building proportions, detailed uh, briefing information and understanding, the relationships and the embedded activities that need to occur, understanding local history and character, and revealing and concealing, the raw and the cooked, <laughs> building as pedagogy, and of course environmental performance and that that uh, elusive bump factor. So, and I've got to say that actually, I've been working from home now for the last few months, and it really struck me how much I do miss that unexpected conversation or interaction with people from my studio. Um, so, look, in less than a year's time, uh, exciting, uh, the construction's progressing very quickly. It seems that in less than a year's time, I really hope that uh, we might actually be able to bump in to each other for real in this building um, or perhaps sitting out in this courtyard. And I look forward to seeing the thrive, it thriving with activity and full of life, a building that's got layers of meaning and a specific purpose that actually draws people in, makes them want to stay. And that new identity for the School of um, Design and Build Environment as well as a key landmark building on the Curtin campus and really hoping that it's something extraordinary and something that really actually matters. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, brilliant. Uh, thank you for outlining different processes that uh, John, the architects, went through to be able to uh, basically design this impressive building. I guess um, we are also very excited to uh, to step into the building when it finishes next year. And I'm pretty sure many of my um, colleagues and other students and practitioners who are here today um, have should have many questions for you. So I just um, ask <laughs> if anyone has any question, please go ahead. Feel free to turn on your microphone or just type your questions and then I can read it out. <laughs> uh, okay, Steve. Uh, Kim, just uh, thanks for that. That was that was really interesting. I didn't know a lot of that um, background and the early stuff on the project. Uh, I was just wondering, when was the last time you came out to see how it was going? And have you been uh, updated via like um, virtual site tours and that kind of thing over the last couple of months? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, it has been a bit more challenging, uh, relying always on, on uh, videos and FaceTime. Um, but of course, um, uh, I didn't mention it, but of course, um, Christo uh, Design Group are our local architect partners and they are continuing to do regular site visits in person. And so um, we're in the, uh, got a lot of trust and um, shared knowledge between um, myself and, and, uh, and Stephen Smart. So um, we, we do do it in partnership, uh, particularly with the, with the site visits at the moment and the restrictions on travel. Um, and, and yes, we, we're constantly getting Photos uh, getting. Oh, we seem to be getting text messages at late at night of a new a new something that's that's happened on site. So um, yeah, it's it's great to to follow it closely in that way. And and look, hopefully, I'll be able to actually walk around and and uh, and and see it and feel it uh, in person quite soon. Yeah, nice one. Thanks. Mm. Okay. Um... I guess I have a question, uh, but Jan, I guess um, I'll read yours first. Uh, sorry, I just go to the chat box. Great, great presentation, Kim. Was Indigenous culture included in the original design brief? Yeah, great question. Um, look, obviously, I wasn't able to include <laughs> include all the elements of the uh, of the design uh, in this, but uh, certainly uh, the the landscape. Uh, design uh, on the north uh, west corner uh, is strongly linked to some um, some briefing information 
around the uh, Living Stream and the uh, Indigenous uh, Trail there that's um, uh, part of the site uh, or that the site is really part of that context. So um, Realm, uh, our landscape architects, um, have uh, done a fantastic job of uh, interpreting that and uh, creating uh, a design there that responds to those ideas. Um, and we hope to see that also extend um, further. But the, um, as far as the, the briefing goes, yes, that was acknowledged as um, an, an important part of the, of the, um, of the, really the landscape design. Thank you, Kim. Um, one question. Um, so could you please talk about coordination and integration of uh, information from relevant consultants and, you know, specialists and suppliers? How did you handle that? Uh, and did you use BIM model or yeah, how did mm. you handle that? Yeah, so those, uh, those snapshots that I showed of the, the clash detection that we used um, the BIM modeling from, um, I mean that that was a, they were amazing. I mean that what what I was showing there in that couple of little snips was one of of literally thousands. And in fact, uh, I think uh, I was just I was going back through my notes on that. In in October last year, we had a meeting, and uh, I think it was me mechanical and fire services, and uh, and we got the we got the clash detection report sent out for the meeting, and there was there was seven hundred clashes to resolve. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this is this is about two months out from issuing all our drawings for for construction to the builder. So um, it's, it's a it's a it's a difficult process and it's it's time consuming and it requires a, a lot of patience. Um, there's some really good principles that you need to set up in terms of where how you structure um, uh, the kind of layering of services and you kind of. Get, you get a broad approach and you kind of go, okay, this is your zone, you know, fire services sit up here at the top near the slab, mechanicals here, you know, lighting and, and electrical sits below. Um, but as I mentioned, there's always so much pressure on these buildings to, to, to be more efficient and to, and to give that space back to, to of course, the, you know, the actual um, the people that occupy it rather than all the, the services. So, you know, rises get smaller, um, and ceiling cavities uh, get compressed, and um, and that's where the the kind of the art form of, of really weaving it together uh, takes on a on a whole another life. Great, thank you, thanks, Kim. Um, Nat. Hi, Kim. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I um, I apologize. I wasn't able to hear. All of it, I've been in and out because the office is kind of buzzing here. But I did want to ask a question. I'm 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 the new head of school and really um, quite excited to be um, coming into your building, um, the design that you guys have put put together for us. I'm just curious. Oh, um, it's your building. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll be uh, we'll be sending it out into the world soon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just. As you as you look back on the projects that the firm has done, specifically mm -hmm. dealing with education and also design education, and what is the biggest impact of the building on design pedagogy or uh, the delivery of design education that you've that you've noticed as an architect? Um, well, I think yeah. Look, I um, I think the the way in which uh, we were able to witness. Uh, particularly at the Melbourne School of Design, uh, Melbourne University um, kind of uh, adapt and evolve their, 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 their teaching methods to, to suit the building. Because of course, you know, the way I described it in this lecture was kind of like, well, all the briefing information is there and then we just do a great job of, of kind of following it in detail. Um, but it, it's really much more of a dialogue. And, and I think that, the, that, that uh, interaction and back and forth um, continues through the through the briefing, through the design phase, but of course into construction and then occupation as well. So um, once you're in there, I'm no doubt that there will be some things which um, you may may not have imagined uh, were possible, uh, or maybe some things that you were thinking you used to do that oh now this doesn't really uh, fit that model anymore. So I, I mean. 
probably if I was to kind of draw on one one thing that that seems to be um, quite a shift and, and important to the design here for the DBE building as well as uh, what we did at, at MSD um, was that because the kind of blurring of the uh, the studio spaces or their specialist learning spaces out into the what we're calling the blue carpet or the informal and I didn't show any particular images of the of these huge pivot doors that we have but I think you know they're another one of these kind of really core uh, design elements that allow really the, the spaces to come together but also in a in a in a in a format that still provides all those wall surfaces for doing pinups um, and for you know projectors and for digital content as well to be displayed so um, everyone wants a flexible building and everyone because no one you know is quite sure how, how they're going to use it in 5 10 20 years time um, but at the same time uh, the the kind of the, the, the risk is that that designing for complete flexibility almost means uh, you, you get nothing so you know striking that balance of of trying to hone in on what you think is really going to work and, and, and kind of uh, taps into the, the key, you know, um, ways of working and, and activities in the building, whether that's, you know, certain configurations of tables and chairs and seats and benches. Um, and that to me is is where you get the, the kind of character and the identity of the, of the building coming out rather than just a, a kind of an empty beige box that could be anything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, Nat, and thank you, Kim. Um, we have a comment from Neil Coney. Neil, uh, do you have a speaker? Do you want to talk? Um, I'm not sure if Neil is there. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, he believes, uh, well, let me just read. Uh, thank you for the presentation, which is greatly appreciated. It's interesting to compare the design of this building with that of the new Keratin Midland building by Leons. The Midland building looked to find context from the Bentley campus to ensure that the building uh, reflected as a family member of the university. This new building wow. currently under construction as presented today does not feel like a family member of the Bentley campus. The exterior of the building seems to present as a non-building, afraid to have its own presence as hiding behind its walls. <laughs> While I'm sure that the interior will be a lovely place to study and function as intended, the exterior seems to have been um, transposed from afar. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a comment. W would you want to respond, Kim? What do you think? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I mean, there's a couple of, couple of points there, but I mean, uh, I suppose I would, I would certainly um, consider that the screen, uh, the screen element is not about um, hiding uh, the building. It is, it is fundamental to the building and, and hopefully I'll kind of uh, explain why that is in terms of its performance, but also the way that it, it articulates the form and, and adds this kind of layer and depth um, to the facade. So um, we don't see that as a, as a kind of a, a method for, for hiding what something is. Um, in fact, it, it, I think it's quite explicit that you can still see uh, you can still see the, the the rest of the building as well. And the other point I would make is that um, yes, you're right that we didn't take the the kind of a literal uh, reference of using red brick um, and applying it here to this building. So yes, we're not we don't have a a red brick building, but uh, equally the uh, the medical building adjacent to us uh, doesn't have that either and I think that there's always a conversation that needs to be had about how the uh, these designs will uh, move forward and so the the kind of um, really what we're trying to do is understand some of the you know those mid-century and early modernist ideas about grease and, and shading and mass concrete but then apply them in a in a much more contemporary um, and new way that that moves the conversation forward thank you kim uh, well lots of phrases and thank you so i don't read them <laughs> but um lee has mentioned um uh, something about design as pedagogy lee do you want to talk 
Yeah, hi, thanks for your presentation. And, um, great to see your different, your explanation of different uh, ceilings and how you're uh, revealing, concealing and exposing. Just mm. wondering why you chose to expose the services in the public gallery area. Um, well, I think um, there was, for me, there was uh, probably uh, an opportunity there to um, to really uh, curate them carefully in a way that um, would add to the the character of, of a gallery space. And I think more often than not now we're seeing um, a lot of exhibition spaces that aren't just trying to be uh, the the kind of blank white box. Um, and certainly, if you look in depth at their design for the exhibition, uh, it's it's not that it's not a it's not a um, uh, all white walls everywhere. It, there's there's a lot of uh, different uh, elements that come into it. So I think um, we we really wanted to to be consistent about when the when the services were concealed, uh, we utilised the the timber ceilings, and they were really um, about defining that the primary circulation spaces um and the and uh and those kind of informal learning areas so moving to the exhibition space needed its own uh needed to have its own character and its own um uh kind of logic so i think uh i'm not sure if that quite answers the question but um yeah, i mean great, uh, great yeah. information thank you thanks kim <laughs> Uh, we we actually have to wrap up in four minutes, but I have uh, a few more questions to read. Basically, Firas has asked that referring to how John Wardell Architects learns from one project to the next, have post-occupancy processes been considered to study spatial use straight away? Uh, post-occupancy processes. So we've done post-occupancy surveys and look, I mean, they, they're, they're, they're useful uh, to some degree and then there's, <laughs> and then not in others. So um, uh, we, we had a very thorough um, post-occupancy evaluation done at Melbourne School of Design um, and uh, that, you know, there was, I suppose, still, uh, you know, we'd highlighted that there was still some uh, internal, I'd say, uh, discussions amongst staff about workplace. I mean, that's, that's and that's probably been, a, you know, I haven't spoken about it at all. But I mean, uh, you could do a whole another talk, uh, which uh, would, which could go over the the issues of workplace design and and uh, the comfort levels that people have with with open plan offices or or not. Um, and so I think um, those kind of uh, Post-occupancy uh, surveys illustrated some of that, that which which we kind of knew. There were and 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 really, um, uh, what's important when you when you're del delivering a building like this is that there's a strong vision, and that uh, for the things that you know you're going to be doing differently, that you bring people along, and there's a kind of a period of education and and bringing people along on the journey and getting them to embrace the, their their new uh, existence. Um, and so, uh, you know, from like I mentioned, from a student perspective, uh, the the building was was kind of skyrocketing off the charts, and in fact, everybody was all the architecture students were constantly complaining they could never get in the building because people would come from all the other faculties to to uh, to use it. So, um, yeah, look, we I'm not sure if we have any formalised processes, but certainly when uh, our clients have, have engaged uh, that kind of um, surveying, uh, we, we keep abreast of it. Great, thank you, Kim. The last question, you've got dampening in the staircase, but what do you expect in terms of the noise level on the learning terrace during the day? This is a question from Emma. Mm. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's a, it is a big volume, um, but we, we do work really hard with all the finishes and the way that the space is articulated. One of the things which, I, again, I didn't touch on, but I'll, I'll mention here now is that around the void, uh, we have a very 
um, all of those balcony and edges uh, utilize uh, what we call harp strings as a balustrade system. So it's a tensile wire system that um, eliminates the need for uh, glass and, and glass balustrades are one of the biggest offenders in these kind of um, large atrium spaces in terms of reflecting and bouncing noise around. Um, so uh, little elements like that uh, can go a long way. There's uh, also just looking at the backing and the, um, the quality of the, we're using a kind of a marmoleum floor surface in that, in that area rather than um, just like polished concrete or something. Um, so you get you get different levels of absorption. There are some um, some other, you know all the timber right above that ceiling. I don't think we ever really showed you a shot of the, the very top ceiling of that atrium space above the learning terrace. But that is again um, all perforated timber with the acoustic um, absorption qualities that it brings. Thank you so much, Kim. I think we need to close the session here. That was a real privilege uh, that we could have you here today. Um, and uh, uh, we are hoping to see you perhaps face to face in the near future. <laughs> yeah, can't wait. Should be great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. everyone for joining us. Um, yeah, thank you, and thanks for all the great questions and um, and lovely comments. I can see them popping up, and um, yeah, it's great to uh, to share it all with everybody. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> see you, Kim. Thanks. See you.